Welcome, everybody. Welcome to what we are calling Outlaws and Outliers. Um, this is a story about two women and two, well, actually four women, because there are two, <laughs> two women here whose names you probably know who have written stories, written books, biographies about two women whose names you probably don't know, but you should know. Um, so we have Catherine Osler, who's sitting next to me, and we have Lady Antonia Fraser. Uh, and the two women that they're going to be talking about are Elizabeth Chudley and Caroline Norton. And these are two women who challenged their positions in society in the 18th and 19th centuries, at a time when women had very few rights and were still largely considered property in the eyes of society. So, um, and I should introduce myself. My name is Hallie Rubenhold, uh, and I'm the author of a book called The Five. Um, and I've written another book about a, a scandalous lady called The Scandalous Lady W. Uh, or Lady Worsley's whim as well. Uh, she was an 18th century, I like to call her a hell raiser. She was very similar to these two women that we'll be talking about today. But um, I want to introduce uh, Catherine first. Um, Catherine is an author and a journalist who has been the editor of Tatler magazine, uh, editor of the Evening Standard magazine, and editor of the Times Weekend. She's also written extensively and been a contributing editor for a variety of publications, including the Evening Standard, Newsweek, the Financial Times, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and US Town and Country. And because we are in the business of selling <laughs> books, uh, I'm not going to be ashamed to hold up her book, uh, The Duchess Countess, which is um, your first book. And Go. I know you're going to be very excited to talk about it. And, and, and dear Lady Antonia Fraser, who I feel almost needs no introduction because she is so prolific. She's an award-winning historian, and I like to think of her as, as the godmother to all women who write history. Um, and her book, <laughs> uh, her 1984 book, The Weaker Vessel, first introduced me to what women's history could really be about. She's written numerous books in the course of her lengthy and enviable career, including uh, biographies of Oliver Cromwell, Charles II, the six wives of Henry VIII, Mary Queen of Scots, and Marie Antoinette, which inspired the film uh, made by Sofia Coppola of the same name. And her most recent book is this one, The Case of the Married Woman. Um, and uh, again, that is about Caroline Norton, who's terrible marriage to a Tory MP helped to change legislation that governed women's lives in the 19th century. So before I jump into that, and I, I, I want to um, I, I want to talk, I want to move chronologically, so we'll go back to the 18th century, but before we do that, I know that Lady Antonia was here at Cliveden with another very scandalous lady. Uh, uh, my first husband, who was a Tory MP, and I, um, when our children were very young, we were offered a cottage at Cliveden, thrillingly, by Lord Astor, who lived here. And that was very exciting. And the cottage was down by the banks of the river, and it was next to someone called Stephen Ward. <laughs> <laughs> he was very nice and polite, and asked to draw my husband's noble head. Didn't seem interested in mine, which in view of subsequent events, perhaps was a good idea. But anyway, we used to come up to Cliveden, and you're looking at someone who didn't dance with someone who danced with the Prince of Wales, but swam in the pool with Christine Keeler. <laughs> <laughs> so I have written one or two books, as you've heard, but that is nothing compared to <laughs> well, 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 there you go. From well, from one scandalous naked lady to another one. And you will understand that segue when, um, when, when Catherine starts telling you a little bit about Elizabeth Chudley. So I'd like to start with, I mean, these women all had remarkable lives. So I'd like to walk you through their lives. I'm going to have Catherine do that. Um, and to tell us a little bit about who, Cath who, who, who Catherine was, <laughs> who Elizabeth Chudley was, and what her upbringing was like. Well, her early upbringing, the first five years, were rather idyllic. They were on the banks of the river in Chelsea. She, her father was Lieutenant Governor of the Royal Hospital, and so she was sort of a much 
doted on child in that magnificent Wren palace. But then it all fell apart when she was very young because her father died before her sixth birthday and they moved into rented accommodation in Mayfair with two weeks' notice where they had a lodger. So she had a sort of falling off in her circumstances. Her parents were first cousins and they were the sort of poor relations of a quite grand family. So there was never quite enough money and her education was patchy. So she had very limited options. Do you think she had an unhappy childhood because of this? Um, not entirely, because I think she was quite resilient and she learned to ride and she did learn to speak French and she was sort of patchily educated but not uneducated. She had sort of very distinguished sort of educated people in her family um, and she was a very sort of active participant in life all the way through. She was always sort of gardening and throwing parties and trying to meet people. So I think it was sort of probably quite traumatic but not unhappy as such. And she Is had... It? Oh, sorry, carry on. Well, no, but there, there were sort of tragedies in it. You know, the father died and then the brother, there were two siblings and then the, fa the brother died when he was 21 at war. So there was the these terrible shadows over it as well. Yeah. Do you think this had some sort of impact on her personality? Do you think the experiences of her youth helped to form her personality? Because she was quite an exceptional woman. I mean, she had quite an interesting personality. What do you, what do you make of her She did have an interesting personality. Yes, I absolutely do. I think she became a sort of survivor, you know, through trauma. She had to, I, 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 you know, one of the frustrations and facts of history is you're entirely reliant on what survives and you can try and imagine things but it, what was very unclear to me was the character of her mother there was just nothing I mean she eventually got a job at Windsor Castle but you never felt quite how involved she was in the daughter's life so she just felt very alone and like she decided to hold her own pen as it were you know she um planned in a way that was more usual for a man, you know, who she was going to meet, what she was going to try and achieve. Mm. And so, but then somebody entered her, her life who really changed the course of it, um, Augustus Harvey. Yes. So do you want to tell us a bit about him and their very interesting and intriguing relationship? Well, it is intriguing and, and, and again, one's dependent on the material. So, you know, Augustus Harvey is this fantastically attractive, charismatic sailor um, who becomes a great naval hero later in life. But early on, he was... In, it, and he, but he also became known as the English Casanova. And he really was... Um, he left a diary, um, which is incredibly sort of revealing and really quite shocking if one wants to go down that path. And he... At 20, she met him. He already had two married lovers, one in Portugal and one in Great Yarmouth. And he was a man of the world. And she was four <laughs> years... And they, they were, he was um, four years younger than her. But she was quite naive and she had a broken heart. She had a broken engagement from the Duke of Hamilton, whose relations had sort of seen her off because she didn't have any money. And she got married in a great rush. And it's not really clear whether they'd been caught in the act and her aunt thought she might be pregnant or whether it was just a summer romance but for some reason she met this very attractive young man and within two months they were married but they were both lying about it because she was a maid of honour at court and to be a maid of honour you had to be a maid of honour you, you couldn't be married and he lived in fear of his grandfather who controlled the family purse strings so neither of them wanted to admit so they got married, and then they immediately lied about it. Mm. So they were in this very odd situation, and it felt like it was on a whim. And so this, this marriage is the real problem, because the yeah. question is, were they or weren't they married? And, and if they were married, why couldn't Elizabeth and Augustus get a, get a divorce? Yeah, I, one of the many reasons I was drawn to her story was I felt... It was like a novel where somebody makes one decision in the heat of the moment and from that the rest of their life is dictated. And that was the case for both of them. They did this thing. It was a 11 o'clock secret, 11 p.m. secret wedding in a country chapel by the light of one candle with the aunt's lady's maid as the witness. And they both spent the next 60 years dealing with the problem of what had happened that night mm. through unbelievable, you know, shenanigans, uh, you know, sort of legal troubles and a, it, all ending up in an enormous court case in Westminster Hall, which, 
if Andrew is here, he'll tell me off for saying this, but I was going to say it anyway, which stopped the American War of Independence for two weeks. It really did. You know, what we were going to do got put on hold because the lawyers who were writing the instructions for the Howe brothers were involved in the case, so they had to put it to one side. And 4,000 people came and watched her being humiliated, really, mm. because she got prosecuted for bigamy. But that was, you know, way ahead mm. in the future. Mm. It, I mean... So, yeah, sorry. Sorry, what were you going to do? No, like no, I was just saying, you know, she made this decision. She married this man. They kept it quiet and everything unraveled. You know, Augustus Harvey would never marry. Um, he had an amazing life, millions of girlfriends. Maybe he wasn't marrying type, but, you know, after that. But it, it just was a sort of thing that nobody could ever come back from. And they went their separate ways. And But she was in a very awkward position. Um, and, uh, and she started to acquire this very scandalous reputation about this time as well. Do you want to talk, what sort yeah. of things did she do? And especially this fancy dress party and what Yes, that's the all famous about. fancy dress. So this is a funny story. I mean, I didn't know about it. Some people did know about it. The reason I was drawn to it was because it, in the way it had been written was startlingly unsympathetic. And so I thought, let's not other this woman, let's try and work out what was actually going on. So as part of this thing, there's the secret wedding. He went away to the West Indies for two and a half years. He came back, they sort of reunited, it didn't really work. They, she'd moved on, she, he had, he was a sort of very strange, attractive, but addictive character. Anyway, it didn't work out between them. And when they finally bust up, um, she went to a party in 1749 wearing a completely see-through dress. I mean, she was technically dressed as if a Janiya from Greek myth. She had a whole story, but basically she was wandering around looking as if she was naked, trying to get attention. And this was such a sort of famous sort of Elizabeth Hurley, Lady Gaga dressed in, in a piece of ham kind of moment that it... it Prints were being produced of this outfit 100 years later. It was a, still a huge story, even in Victorian times. Yeah. Um, and so that was the point at which she became properly famous. And everyone started sort of writing about her and writing poems about her and sort of, you know, cartoons featuring her. And she just became a sort of... She was sort of famous for being... And for decades famous, afterwards really. and as well, decades this, afterwards, this, this yeah. scandalous woman, this figure who dared appear, like basically almost naked in public in the middle of the 18th yeah. century. Yes, and she became proper shocking. newspaper fodder. So yes. this is also at the time when the sales of British newspapers going yes. up through like that because of the lapse of the Licensing Act in 1695. So no libel laws, everyone can write whatever they like and literacy rates... And the love of the British love of the press is sort of taking off. Mm. And she's just, she's always, she's consistently and for decades an amazing story because of outfits and who she's trying to meet and people hinting she might be married and who she's going to marry next. And she's just sort of this kind of figure of the, pay, of the press mm. in a way we, that feels quite contemporary. So this question about marrying and... and that there's somebody else who enters the scene around this time. It's the, well, the man who will become the, the second Duke of Kingston upon Hull. So just to complicate everything, do you want to tell a story about what happened now? We've got kind of a weird love triangle going on. Uh, yes, well, so technically she's still married to Augustus Harvey. Yeah. They're not speaking to each other. Um, and it, it sort of enough people know... Actually, she had never told anyone they'd be married. He had told one person, and that one person told, who, I hate to say it, was a woman, but anyway, told <laughs> everybody, and then sort of everybody in a certain circle knew, and then it got into the press. Then she met a sort of soldier general duke of Kingston, who Horace Walpole described as the handsomest man in England, and everyone said he was a wonderful chap, he was so good-looking, he was so kind, he was you know, the one, and he owned these vast estates from, he owned half of Bath, and he owned sort of Lincolnshire anyway. And so suddenly she met this man who she undoubtedly loved, but also represented security in every sense. Um, and then they had a 15-year period when she was trying to work out what to do, because he could just die, and she would be left with nothing. She had nothing. He built her a house, but she didn't own it. And 
So she was in this very awkward spot of wanting to marry him, but being secretly married to someone she couldn't divorce. And then Augustus Harvey... I'm trying to <laughs> feel I'm telling the whole story here. But anyway, Augustus Harvey then said he wanted a divorce, and that's why she entered this sort of legal process of trying to prove that she didn't accept that she'd ever married him in the first place. Yes. And that's what she did. And the ecclesiastical court agreed with her, and so she was free to marry the Duke of Kingston. But the... the I'm sorry, it all went pear-shaped at it some point. It all went pear-shaped because he, they had a wonderful time. Four years later, he died, and his, he left her everything for her lifetime. And his relations, his nephews, who had always traded on being his heirs, in fact, one of them said he was going to be the next Duke, went around London saying he was going to be the next Duke of Kingston, even though he was the daughter's son, so it was all sort of made up. But he... Um, they decided to prove that she had already been married mm. in the hope of invalidating the will. So that's how she ended up in uh, the, this the big bigamy, bigamy trial. trial. And the bigamy trial by his nephews yes, yes. is the main event, really, isn't yes. it? Yes, and that is the main event. April 1776, everybody came. James Boswell came, the Queen, Charlotte came, even though she was two weeks off having a baby. She brought five young children with her, including... Three future monarchs, William IV, George III, she brought and Queen Victoria's father, you know, they all, um, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, everybody sort of, people crossed Europe in carriages to come to this thing, you know, people sort of, with their hair and two women <laughs> fell off the gallery and got stuck on men's heads and it was, you know, it was a sort of absolutely... Great 18th century story. It was just a brilliant 18th century, yes, exactly, and it was a sort of people keeping meeting in coffee shops and having dinner parties and it was like a sort of huge sort of five-day gala and people you know and she fainted. and this woman's and life everyone... is falling apart in the meantime yeah uh, yeah and there's an amazing prince of this world you know, she slightly played up to it in a sense because she had this theatrical streak and everybody said that when she arrived she looked like she was dressed as mary queen of scots for the execution so she wore sort of all black with a white ruff and sort of very sedate like this, and she walked in, and the prince, you can see this one woman, and her jury were the entire House of Lords. Every single Gosh. peer was ranged, round, dressed, and every one of them had to stand up at the end of the trial and say, guilty or not guilty. And the, the They all said guilty, apart from one, the Duke of, of Newcastle, who was her friend, and he said guilty but not intentionally. <laughs> And they went round and there was 140 of them and then they sat down. So you know. where do you go from that point if you have been found guilty of bigamy? What happens? What happens to this poor woman? Well, what she did um, is she commissioned... She took it, it, Lord Mansfield of Kenwood House, who was involved in the case, somehow convinced everyone that just because she found guilty didn't mean that she should lose the money because he felt very strongly that this was... Uh, this had only been brought to humiliate her and that it wasn't really fair because it, the problem was with the marriage laws of the 18th century, which hadn't been clear um, and were changed in 1753. So this very far-sighted, wonderful man somehow arranged that although she'd been found guilty, she still kept the money. So that taught the relations a lesson because they'd spent 15 years and lots of money themselves trying to get absolutely nothing. So she then commissioned herself a private yacht and they said, as you do, as you do, to go into St. Petersburg. And they said, right, you, you, we're not going to punish you, but you can't use your title. You are no longer the Duchess of Kingston. Um, you're in fact Countess of Bristol, because that was the first husband, which is why the book's called The Duchess Countess, because that became Horace Walpole's nickname. For me. Anyway, so she got this boat made, and on the side, she named it the Duchess of Kingston. Um, and she just <laughs> sailed so into St. Petersburg. <laughs> to make friends with Catherine the Great. And then she went on this sort of European odyssey of courts, trying to sort of befriend interesting people to rehabilitate her reputation. She was effectively free in some ways. Free, she, because she became an outlaw. She became she a social became outlaw. She became a total outlaw, yes, she did. Although she, you know, she had a terrible spending money problem. I mean, it's not clear, actually, whether it was a problem or whether she just wanted to spend it all before she died so there'd be nothing left for the nephews. I'm not entirely sure which it is. So um, I can't work out whether it was sort of compulsive or deliberate or both. But anyway, she did go on this mad sort of 12-year spending spree across Italy, Russia, Estonia and France. And She got her own back somehow. She did, yeah. Definitely. Well... I want, to, I want to turn to Caroline Norton now, so we're going to move forward 
into the, into the 19th century. But another woman who was entangled with the courts, um, and this was, she, she was born Caroline Sheridan. And Antonia, can you tell us a bit about her early years and who were the Sheridans? The Sheridans descended from Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the uh, playwright, school for scandal, etc., and politician, a great character. And um, Caroline was his granddaughter, the daughter of his son, Tom Sheridan. There were three daughters, and they were known as the Three Graces, inevitably, but one was Georgina, Duchess of Somerset, who was the Queen of Beauty at the Eglinton Tournament. One was Helen, who became Lady Dufferin, and she was the gentle, nice one. Georgina was the beautiful one. And then there was Caroline, and she was the wit and the clever one and independent. And her grandfather, Sheridan, looked at her and said, I wouldn't like to meet this child in a dark wood. She had <laughs> very dark hair, um, well, you can sort of see it on the cover, um, very dark hair and um, huge eyes and dark eyebrows and eyelashes, which were known as wicked, and she was famous for wickedly using her eyes. Anyway, she, um, she was sort of always spirited and um, individual, and then, as the most spirited individual women did, um, she got married age 19 to someone who now we look back and say, how could she have married George Norton? But the answer is it was a conventional thing to do. She didn't know, as the great historian Maitland said, we must always remember that what now lies in the past once lay in the future. She didn't know the way her story was going. And so she married this man who was madly in love with her, Tory MP, not sort of Whiggish like her. And life didn't seem so bad. She had three children. She had a nice little house in um, Stories Gate and in Westminster. And then one day he said, really, I need a bit of money. And there's a magistrate's uh, position open, which is paid. Now, you with your Whiggish feelings, why <laughs> don't you tackle Lord Melbourne? Um, he's what might be helpful. Why don't you ask him to come and see you to get a job for me? OK, she said. Now, Caroline was naturally flirtatious, which means exactly what it says. She was very popular because she was always doing sort of naughty things in public. She had admirers, but there was no, uh, no, no scandal, no belief that she was anything but a, having a salon, enjoying herself, enjoying life. And Melbourne came and knocked at the door. And then a very different story began. And the question is, and all of my readers are entitled to their own view as to what went on next. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I found with people very different views, you know, slight tendency of men to think one thing and women to think the other, <laughs> in, in, in so far as I dare make the distinction. Um, but I'm not gonna tell you which is which. Anyway, um, to continue the story, <laughs> sorry. George Norton got increasingly jealous and obsessed. And I'm afraid, as obsessional people do, he started to indulge in what is now called domestic abuse, i.e. he used to hit her. Now, a married woman had no rights, not even the right not to be hit, which is so shocking. There was a theory you shouldn't hit her with anything thicker than your thumb. I mean, isn't this appalling? But, um, all she could do was suffer it. Anyway, it was a mark of his obsession, which didn't make it any better for her, including once he probably caused a miscarriage. Anyway, did she start to get very close to Lord Melbourne, a very attractive woman, not very happily married, a widower, as he was, and um, as he became Prime Minister at 10 Downing Street, very handy at Stories Gate. We don't know. They certainly, um, people, hostesses said, if you want to please Lord Melbourne, ask Caroline Norton. And then one day he was persuaded into suing Lord Melbourne for something called criminal conversation, which is adultery in our words, a rather odd phrase. 
and suing the Prime Minister for adultery. As if a Prime Minister would ever commit adultery. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> and £10,000, which was like £100,000. Um, and then there was a case. And in this case, although Caroline was central to the case, she had no rights. She had no counsel. She couldn't be there. The two people who had counsel were George Norton and Melbourne. She went and stayed with her mother at Hampton Court. Her mother had a grace and favour apartment. And she had to sit there while well, the trial went on. Well, it was an extraordinary trial. Um, my grand one of my granddaughters, who's then reading for the bar now, a barrister, got the trial for me very carefully, cleverly, mm. got a copy of it. And um, I was completely hooked. And I promise you, mm. whatever you think of my book, you'll be hooked on the trial. Because the servant's evidence, I couldn't in this nice family structure give you some of the details, <laughs> but um, I'll just mention sheets and that sort of thing. Yes, thoughts. and what, what the butler saw really yeah. factored into that. I mean, criminal conversation was one of these things, much like the bigamy trial that you mm. were describing, was, yeah. was, was something, gosh, people would queue up to actually members of the public to go to these criminal conversation trials. Yes. And the bigamy trial, again, hinged on one servant's evidence. Yes, yes. Right, you, you yeah. know, they, it's absolutely it's true, and they paid an enormous amount for tickets, the equivalent of 500 mm. pounds. But all the time, Caroline Norton waits at Hampton Court, which I worked out is, was two hours by carriage or messenger. And um, the evidence seems to go all against them, the servants coming in, finding ruffled hearth rugs, Caroline perhaps on the floor, um, rushing to her bedroom and make up. You know, what is going on here? And everything seems to be going against Melbourne. And then the counsel for the defence starts, and he points out that all the servants have been sacked for one reason or another, and one in particular had been sacked for drink, a, a carriage driver, who had a coachman, who had um, been sacked for driving the coach when drunk in a terrible incident. And gradually, you know, you can feel the opinion turning. Mm. And finally, the judge sums up and says, there are two things here. One is familiarity, and the other is intimacy, by which he meant sex. And we have to decide whether it was familiarity or sex. And there was another point, which has always convinced me, I'll now let you into the secret. Mm. I think that they were innocent of full sex. Mm. because all the servant's evidence occurred because they, a bell was rung and a servant was requested to attend. Now, once again, <laughs> how, do, how, do we, how do we know what you do when you commit adultery? But I don't believe you ring a bell for a servant. No, you know? no, almost certainly um, not. Anyway, in the end, the judge found them not guilty. And this is when it gets very dark. So, not guilty and... Caroline writes an ecstatic letter. She's in the middle of writing it to her brother. She just got the message. It's against him, you know, and I shall be free and my children won't scorn me. But it was against him technically. He now legally throws her out of the house, legally stops her from seeing her three children under seven, this innocent woman and legally lives off the copyright of her book. She was a writer. Mm. Because a married woman had no rights. Yes. As she wrote, a married woman doesn't exist. Now, I mean, I would have just lain on the floor and wailed. But <laughs> Caroline started then to campaign. And her first campaign was the Infant Custody Act, of, passed in 1839, by which, revolutionary idea, a mother had right of access to her children. And then she went on with other campaigns. So good for her. Yes, e extraordinary, extraordinary. I mean, that's the, the other thing that um, I think we haven't we haven't mentioned is just what a talented woman she was. All the things she could turn her hand to. I mean, she was a very accomplished writer, wasn't she? She was a very good writer. Um, I, there her novels. I like Old Sir Douglas, the last one best. But also her pamphlets, her campaigning pamphlets, a letter to the Queen, for example. The young Queen Victoria, K 
came into this, uh, ascended the throne in 1837, a year after the trial, which was 1836. And she appeals to her and says, here are you, a female on the throne, and we women are being treated in this appalling way. She was really good at that, and she could also sketch. And she was a muse. Painters loved to paint her. And um, in the House of Lords, even today, the picture on the back, which you can't really see, it's her as justice in the centre. She was taken as the figure of justice, as the model. There's an emancipated slave with his odious shackles just there, and there's a child and angel. Mm. And there were other pictures of her. So she was a yeah. remarkable woman. So the, the Custody of Infants Act, I mean, this is really, really important for a number of reasons. I mean, she also played a role in the creation of the Matrimonial Causes Act, which was passed in 1857. Yes. Um, and this was this is really important. Because, I mean, the, the position of women at this time were, married women were property. They belonged to their husbands. Yes, property. And their children were the property of the husbands as well. And so this... Act. How did this change things? Well, because it said that a, a woman had an undoubted right up to the age of seven, or a child's age of seven, to see her own children. And it's so extraordinary, you know, that that didn't exist before, but it's no good saying that. It didn't exist before. But oddly enough, the arguments against it were by people, particularly in the House of Lords, saying it would encourage women to commit adultery if they thought they could just commit adultery and uh, have their children, you know, have it all. And at the same time, there was just one section of women who did have rights over their children and access to them at all times. And these were unmarried mothers. Mm. Wasn't that illogical? Unmarried mothers who were technically immoral, if you like to talk like that, had more rights over their children than the married ones who were moral. Mm. It's, it's ludicrous. It's, it's amazing. So she also, I mean, the, the Matrimonial Causes Act, again, I mean, she has, uh, she was involved in this. And in fact, also, her campaigning helped to contribute to the Married Women's Property Act in 1870. These were huge strides forward in, in women's rights at this time. Yes, absolutely. Um, at the same time, she had terrible personal sorrow um, uh, George Norton took the children to Scotland where the law was slightly different and then one of them Willie the youngest died age seven in an accident falling off a pony he never would have been allowed to be alone on a pony if she'd been there and he wasn't tended he died of septicemia calling for her mm. and she had to arrive last sent for she was at a spa at Tunbridge Wells she was met by someone, uh, a woman she didn't know, uh, uh, Mrs. Kelly, and she said, how is my boy? And Mrs. Kelly said, your boy is dead. I mean, wasn't that terrible? Oh, it was horrible, uh, truly awful. I mean, she suffered such tragedies and had so much difficulty in her life. And I, I wonder, do you think that she ended her life? Well, there was, any, was there any happiness towards the end of her life? Well, I was so pleased to discover that... Um, if you pursue the life to the end, she'd had um, a young admirer called Sir William Sterling, handsome Scott, who's also very clever, wrote a book about Spanish painting, which is still respected. And they remained friends, and when she was separated from George Norton, as they were after the case forever, she took her children, and she was allowed to see them again, to stay with him, then he married Lady Anna, and they were very happy, and they were all friends. And then Lady Anna died young in a terrible accident. And Sir William Sterling, towards the end of Caroline's life, which she was quite, uh, really quite frail and ill um, in her late 60s, which, you know, was sort of like late 70s for us, perhaps, um, he protected her and looked after her. And they had a very late marriage, which she could only manage in her sofa in her house, the vicar came, and they got married. It was very romantic. He'd been in love with her before he was married. And um, she wrote a poem to his birthday, sort of a month before she died, saying, call me wife. And so Caroline, who'd had this terrible life as a married woman, ended it 
what she'd always wanted to be, a happy married woman. Mm. That's, that, I'm so I'm pleased to hear that. It's, uh, there's all, it's a, a, a happy ending. It's always what you want, and it's not always how it ends up. I, I, it's, it's interesting. I want to bring Catherine into this as well, mm. even though, Antonia, this is what you wrote in your author's note to this book, and I think it raises such an important question, an important issue when we're writing about women's lives historically. And, and you write in your author's note, the very start of the book, Throughout, I have tried to bear in mind the values of the mid-19th century. Caroline's attitudes to several issues, notably the equality of women, are not those of our own day. But it is surely important to judge historical characters by the standards of their own time, while recognizing and applauding the changes that have taken place. Mm. Well, now, why did you feel compelled to write that? And, and Catherine, do you agree with this? Well, I. It, it took me more trouble than the whole of the rest of the book because I feel this so strongly. It's no good judging people. Um, I'm sure I have prejudices, which I don't know I have, which my great-grandchildren, which I already have four, will grow up to think, how could grandma possibly put that? But we mustn't judge. And it's important, because she, Caroline is interested in practical things, getting women to see their children, to enjoy their copyright, to be able to sign leases, all practical. She's not interested um, in saying that women are equal. She, she doesn't bother with all of that. So she's not what we would now think of as a feminist. She's 20 years um, older than the first real wave of feminism. And so you could quote some of her sentences like, um, God created men. Uh, women inferior to men. You could quote that and say, oh, how terrible. But actually, you then ask yourself, did Caroline think she was inferior to anyone? Absolutely not, mm. and certainly not to George Norton. Mm. It was just, you know, what, the way people talked. Yes, she was a woman of her time. Mm. Catherine, what do you think? Um, I think there was sort of, uh, it r reminds me, there's one bit when Elizabeth's trying to sell this property and she writes to the man who she's trying to sell it to, she says, sort of, forgive me for negotiating like a man. I know you find it shocking in a woman, but, you know, not negotiating hard enough has ruined many a man, you know, and I don't want to be like them. And she's sort of almost apologising for behaving like a man. So I think she also had this practical streak where she, and a great sense of injustice, but it, it, it's a difficult sort of issue, this, because we don't want to sort of judge them by our own standards. Exactly. But on the other hand we cannot help but see them through the prism of what we now know. And I think biography particularly changes over time. I mean, we come at it and we think, well, why were they doing this? And what were they really thinking? And we can't help but bring all our knowledge of, you know, mental health, for example, or um, what we were talking about earlier, sort of medical information, you know, which moves on so quickly um, all of that comes to inform what we write. Mm. Mm. History and biography evolve yeah. with the, exactly. the, the, the times and who's writing. Psychoanalysis it. and you know genetics and all these things oddly play a part. Yeah. In, yeah. Is there a so, danger in applying the word feminist to either of these women? Is there a danger? Do you believe? I think you can sort of weasel out of it by using feminist with a small f. Um, because, uh, you know, I don't know what you think. But, uh, um, because, it, it's no, as I say, it's no good pretending that she marched asking for the vote. She was before the vote, you know, she wasn't interested in the vote. I mean, uh, 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 women weren't then interested in the vote, but it was coming. Mm. And how wonderful, you know, we can now see the vote was absolutely essential. Um, but I, um, you could argue about whether she was a feminist. I would say that she had such a strong belief in women, that women could do things and they needed help, you know, and that. You can't say she wasn't a feminist. Mm. Yeah. No, and I, I, you know, compared to Elizabeth, she probably was because she was sticking up for all women, whereas yes. dear old Elizabeth was basically sticking up for herself. I yes. mean, she wasn't trying to yes. involve everybody else in her campaign. She was trying to get herself out. Yes, of, you know. it, it, I think that is true. I mean, <laughs> I, I loved your book. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Um, but, uh, I mean, for instance, um, Caroline was very 
naturally in favor of the emancipation of slaves, which was becoming a great yeah. campaign, I mean, earlier. But she was particularly interested in black slave women and the high death rate, which was much higher than that of the men, which I must say, I hadn't realized that till I read her books. No. You know, she, she fixed on a mm. practical fact mm. and the children, what happened to children. And her novels very much go in, I mean, there's one centered on a person, we would, a girl we would call disabled, she called crooked, that was the language, you know. I mean, if we were correcting her novel, we'd cross out crooked and put mm -hmm. disabled, but we shouldn't do that. Mm. And there's another about someone we would call mixed race, <coughs> who's an illegitimate daughter of a, a, a match between two races. So she's naturally very sympathetic to the disadvantage. Mm. Mm. She was very empathetic. I found that very touching. She was always sort of right, giving them happy endings, wasn't she? Yes. Making it all right for the sort of, you know, under privileged, yes. you know, her mm. novels are very humane. Mm. Do you think, I mean, you know, I know we, we, we often try to, you know, I think it's this impulse we have. We try to make these women uh, in the shape of, of the women we know and we yeah. admire. And because the past was a completely different context, we can't always, we can't do that at all. We have to be very, very careful not to do that. But at, at the same time, I find it very interesting, you know, history has a tendency, historically, we have tended to vilify strong women. Yes. Um, especially, you know, if you think back, you know, you look at any strong woman, and I'm thinking particularly of women like uh, Anne Boleyn or Lucretia Borgia or Catherine the Great. You know, these women are all often described in their own time and then remembered in ours as being, you know, sexually depraved, you know, mm. abusive, mm. they were called witches. And, and often when we talk about them, we, we're still reiterating these same tropes. We're saying the same things. So why, why haven't we, or why do you think we are so quick to repeat these things about, like, for example, everybody knows Catherine the Great and her horse. You know, you ask anybody a fact about Catherine the Great, and they'll recite that, and that's, it's patently untrue. So why are we so wedded to these stories about strong women, which make them look not as strong, but broken in many ways? Well, it's a very, very good question. I, I must say, I did find myself wondering, what did Catherine the Great do with her horse? Yes. <laughs> I'll give you one guess, Antonia. <laughs> I, I realize I should be ashamed of it, but I was obvious. Well, it wasn't, what did Caligula do? He made him into a senator. Perhaps she, perhaps she made him into a senator. Perhaps. <laughs> I just think these sort of versions of history just echo down the centuries unquestioned until somebody stands in their way and says, hang on a minute, is, is that true? Is that fair? Mm. Um, and also, I think, if you've got a strong woman, the best way to neutralise the threat is to be rude about her. Mm. So what do you do? You don't understand this woman who lives alone with a cat, so you call her a witch. Yeah. You know, so it's a way of dealing with sort of fear of the unknown, isn't it? Yeah. But doesn't it come down to... The fear, shall we say, in the past, that women sh would have control, and that's why the, the use of the word "strong woman" has got an element right. of contradiction. Mm. They shouldn't be strong. They shouldn't have control. Mm. Um, yeah. as, as to why that is, we'd have to ask God, Almighty God if she's listening. <laughs> <laughs> and on, on that she, note, yeah. uh, oh, uh, uh, what would you like to carry on? Is it? Uh, uh, on that note, I, I would like to ask the almighty audience if they have <laughs> any questions. Um, and I think there are, are there roving mics going around? Okay. And uh, you know, in the center. So you've all written about women who were in their time perhaps misunderstood and given a more well-rounded view. And a lot of them, as you said, were vilified in their time. Do you think that's happening today and that women in the public eye and who are well known are still being vilified and historians might look in the future and think actually the society did not understand them and they vilified them? That's a very good question. Um, either of you, would you like to answer? Uh, are, are women today, uh, as women historians, are women in the public eye still being vilified? Um, well, I think, um, well, there were criticisms that you could make of Mrs. Thatcher of anybody as well as you could of anybody. I think she was vilified for her sex also. 
you know, and possibly not given an... She was criticised for being strong when perhaps she should have been admired. Um, I mean, if, if that's... Uh, do you think that's a good example? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Catherine, do you have any thoughts um, on this? Yes, I certainly think this sort of behaviour is scrutinised in a different way, and I think sometimes a different sort of mode of talking or writing enters the discourse when it's about a woman. I, I do still think that's the case. Um, I don't really think of political about, uh, examples, really, which I can't sort of really face, but we all know, you know, what goes on on Twitter and, the, mm. you know, the horrendous abuse that some MPs, for example, are subjected to, female mm. MPs. Mm. Yes. You know, so there it is, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, think that's... I think one encounters it, and I've written about uh, men as well as women. My mm. first subject was Mary Queen of Scots, so that's fine, woman. But my second subject was Oliver Cromwell, and that wasn't fine at all uh, for a woman. And instead of having lovely reviews, which we all like, as I certainly deserved, I got rather <laughs> naturally, <laughs> I got horrid critical reviews. And the worst of all was from a famous historian who, uh, up to then, I much respected, called G. R. Elton, and he said. What does this nice middle-class woman know about the torments of a man like Oliver Cromwell? Mm. Anyway, I, I was extremely annoyed by this. <laughs> this is 1973, and I was asked to an Anglo-American historical conference to speak. And uh, I'm not a very confident speaker, and an actor friend of mine trained me. You focus on someone in the audience, and you make it to them, and that gives you confidence. So I duly focused on someone, sort of quite dark, was a man, and, and you know, it was easy to focus, and, and I got to my peroration, um, um, he is wrong in every way, um, I am not middle class, I am not nice, and I have every right to write about Oliver Cromwell, and there were roars of laughter, and it went on for a rather long time, I'm still laughing, I thought it wasn't that funny. <laughs> and afterwards, one of my friends came up and said, we all thought you were so amusing. And I said, well, yes, I saw that. Why? Well, I'm not all that amusing. Why? And he said, well, you delivered your whole lecture directly at G.R. Elton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that absolutely marvellous? <laughs> Can we have, is there another question from the audience? This gentleman in the front. Thank you. Lady Antonia particularly might be best placed to answer this. Do you think there will become a time soon when you don't walk into Hatchards or Walterstons and see women's history as a subset? Do you think it will be that we have true equality and history is history? Well, I don't want to see that day because when I first wrote history, there wasn't a section saying women's history. Mm. And I think just as there should be a section saying military history, why not have a section saying women's history? Um, so I don't want to see that day. Um, I want there to be both, you know, and I want there to be mixed and biographies of history. I mean, the more, more books, the more bookshops, and the more mm. histories. Mm. Catherine. Well, I was just thinking, you know, women's history is a sort of funny idea, really, because we do tell the stories of these women, but, you know, in my book, certainly, there's a woman, but the, it's just as much the story of Augustus Harvey, really, and the Duke of Kingston, and a portrait of the Georgian world and the patriarchy. It's not just a woman's hmm. story, and equally, you know, Caroline Norton involves, you know, the husband, the prime minister's you know, Prime Minister, it's not, you know, no woman, ex no woman is an island, mm. you know, so yeah. they don't exist in isolation, mm. so it's sort of... But I think your, your book, your lovely book, should be in both, should both <laughs> be in women's history and in, and in biography. Right, well, actually, bookshops do get very confused. Yes. I don't know whether I it's a it's history book or biography, and it turns up all over the place. So quite <laughs> difficult in that way. Yeah, I, yeah. I think, I think my, my mm. feeling is that I think... Um, that by calling it women's history, I think we've now. I think there was a time when we needed to call it women's history, and I think now we've got to move the definition of history further. So calling it women's history or calling it any other type of history others it, so that there is a standard history, and then there are all these other sub-histories. It, 
just needs to be called history because that is what it is. We need to embrace all of it. We have the same debate in literature, right? So when I read English, there was a special course which was half a term of nine, which was women's writing. And then you think, well, that's 50% of the human race and it's, it's getting an 18th of the course. Yes. Is that sort of great because you're going to study it or is that sort of, as you say, just mm -hmm. othering it into something inconsequential? And I think we have the same yes. sort of question mark. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions? Person with a big hand up high at the back in the middle. I just wonder if you could just say a bit about your sort of research process when you're putting something like this together. and Just a bit, how long does it take? You know, where do you start? How do you go about it? Okay, who wants it? Catherine, Antonia, who would like to start? Antonia, <laughs> you go first. You've well, researched many more than I have, so I think it will be more oh, interesting. Well, I, 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 <laughs> I, I begin, perhaps it sounds boring, but it's essential, but by getting the facts, um, you know, before I get onto themes and characters, I want to know what the facts are, and then I start dividing it up. I have card indexes, white cards, which I like, helps me to sort of concentrate on themes, and then I carry on making notes on books, which I still do by hand, partly because in libraries, you always had to. And then uh, I do a vital thing, three months. I spend three months at the end of it structuring, and I think that's very important because that's what I do, what I give to history. I structure it. It took place whether I care, care for it or not, and I sort of structure it so that I do that for the reader so that there is a narrative, you know. And that's, when I've done that, then I write like a what about you, Cass? Well, I'm now going to copy that because that's not what I did. I did something, first book, I did something much more chaotic, which was start um, as, you know, who's on the committee of Clifton. I'm going to say I came across the idea in Simon Seabag Montefiore's book and then I started reading about it, you know. Uh, and then I sort of read all the letters I could get hold of and... Then I got obsessed with going everywhere she'd ever been, where she grew up, and in Chelsea and Russia. And I went on this sort of, you know, climbing over fences to break into the chateau that she bought in France. So I slightly, completely lost the plot in search of the plot, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> what you're doing is yeah. very important, which I did mention, because it's a sort of going on. What it's called optical research. Oh, yeah, I love a bit of yes, optical research. That's optical important. research. Exactly, it's yeah. a very good tax phrase. So oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> tax efficient, yeah. It, me it means going there and looking at it, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of going it. there and looking at it, and particularly St. Petersburg, where she had these... She'd left a trail of possessions behind in Russia, mm. and they were in the Hermitage, and mm. so, you know, they fantastically got um, hung up there in an exhibition just as I was finishing the book. So, That's you know, but there's nothing like the thrill of seeing the person's handwriting that you, you write about the person. Or seeing the person's person. house that they lived or, in. Oh, yes. Yeah. And That's yeah, so well, useful. And, and this, it's, not yeah. just, it, it's not just going on a jolly somewhere. No, no, it's not. And it's, Absolutely. Um, it wasn't until I saw the room um, in Edinburgh Castle where Marie Antoinette Oh, sorry. Ha, ha, ha. Mayor Queen of Scots. I don't make that mistake in print, I don't think. <laughs> no, but the room where Riccio was murdered in front of her eyes when she was pregnant, until I saw how tiny the room was, I didn't have an understanding of the scene. Yeah. Uh, and so I agree with you. You, yes. you see things. That you I think that's absolutely true. You don't really understand. And I had to say, this French chateau I'm talking about, she bought it six months before she died. She was widowed. She was spending money. She'd run out of money. And I saw this place, and it was absolutely enormous. It had been owned by a, a, a prince of the blood. And I thought, right, she was crackers. She was <laughs> trying to buy her own Versailles, you know, an invalided woman who was a widow and I sort of thought again is she burning through the cash or has she still got enormous ambitions so there's these sort of you, you can't quite understand mm. these things unless you do a totally 360 I, I, I reading I absolutely and seeing, agree. Sure you agree you have to go and walk in their footsteps and then you pieces fall into place you can you, fall into you place do you, you do a sight else. view you know of, of what you know oh that happened there she couldn't have seen that through the window because so that must not be true or various things like that all sorts of things come together that you don't 
you don't appreciate when you're just reading it. And then the women who've been famous at the time, I'm sure this is true of Caroline, they then have an afterlife. So she became much written about after her mm. death, and then Thackeray reinvented her as a heroine and partly based Becky Sharp on her life oh. and another one of his heroines as well. So the, then the story is a, a, a becomes a story yes. as well, and then you're sort of unravelling what... Yeah. In fiction, I mean, mm. Caroline... Um, most famously, really, mm. in terms of what we read, the tenant of Wildfell Hall. Right, exactly. So um, but then the, at the time, Diana of the Crossways by Meredith, which was openly about her, and sort of mm. accused her of slipping information to a newspaper. Um, and everybody said, oh, it was all exactly her story. But in fact, it left out an enormous element, which were the children, you know. Mm. So fiction. Um, it lives, but it, it, mm. it takes a different path. Mm -hmm. mm. I think we have time for one more question. Who wants to be the... Ah, a hand. Can't see that. Hello, I'm Rani Singh. I'm a journalist uh, with River Radio. Thank you very much for the talk. Who is left? Who else would you like to write about that you haven't written about yet, both of you? Oh, that's a great final question for both of you. Catherine? Um, well, look, I'm mid the next project, which is about a family in Paris, who, which is called the Renoir Girls, and they're painted by Renoir, and it's what happens to three sisters. But, you know, there are plenty... I mean, the thing about writing about women, if we're going to say we're writing about women, is that there are so many untold stories yes. out there, as yeah. Hallie will testify. So I think coming up with the ideas isn't the problem, it's just sort of making sure you've got enough to sort of, yes. you know. The endless, you know. endless stories. And endless, yeah, that bit's not, that bit's not the problem, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> what, what Antonio, you? No, I am doing a book, it is about a woman. Forgive me if I don't tell you, it's sort of superstition about <laughs> not doing. But I'll tell you about uh, two people I will never write about, and I wish, because I'm not capable of it, I would like to have written about. One is Catherine the Great. Then I would have found out about that horse. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time, Antonia. <laughs> no, because she, her first language was German, as you know, and I don't have mm. good German. I, I learned it at school, but I, uh, Marie Antoinette, thank goodness, was brought up in French, not German, because her father was French, insisted on speaking French. I must feel at home in the language and be able to read the letters. Mm. And the other also would, was the Empress Maria Theresa, mm. um, mother of Marie Antoinette, had 15 children, very interesting character. And as far as I know, there isn't a good book about it in English, so do you have good German? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. GCSE, good idea, though. <laughs> We could find somebody with good German, maybe yes. to accompany you to all of the archives. Yeah. I'm sure that yeah. would be a job that somebody would love very much <laughs> to, <laughs> to mm. do. Oh, I think if we can squeeze in one final question. Uh, if, if a woman can write a history about a man, can a man write a history about a woman? Yeah. Why not? They've been doing in, it for centuries. Who, who do you? <laughs> <laughs> in who, this day and age, in the, in the 21st century, can these things still be done? Why not? Why not? We'll there are three women who say, who did you have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> no in particular, just a, a, a comment on an earlier discussion in this room about uh, uh, literary uh, prejudices and oh, what people right. can write about uh, in these days. Well, and I, not. I don't personally have them. I, the idea that... Um, People have to be the, se the right sex or even sexual proclivity, you know. Um, it, 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 I think is wrong. I, I believe in freedom of writing. And then see whether it's a good book. I, I agree. I think yeah. history... Yeah. His, history yeah. Yeah. You, I was just saying knowledge, empathy, analysis are required. It doesn't matter who's writing yeah. about who. I mean, it's the know, human experience but, yeah. is the human experience. And on that note, I would like to thank both of our authors, Lady Antonia Fraser, Catherine Osler, for taking the time to tell us about their books. The books are on sale, if you're interested. Um, and thank you for being such a wonderful audience and asking great questions. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day at Cliveden. <laughs> <laughs>